Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Minahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take a look at Ashes, Rise of the Phoenix Born from Plaid Hat Games. Now, it's really neither here nor there, but I will say in the interest of full disclosure that I was very briefly a playtester for Ashes. I didn't finish the playtesting. I think I did like seven or eight games before I got too busy and I had to drop out, unfortunately. But I had a pretty good grasp of how the game was going. They did change uh, some minor things I know from between that build and between now to the final version. So I did play the final version several more times just to make sure. But most of what I remember was intact. I think pretty much all of it. Uh, but just so you know that I did have that history with the game. Now if you're not familiar with the backstory of Ashes, and you might not be, in this world there was this dark force called the Kimra that was ripping the, the vestiges of humanity apart until finally there were these powerful sorcerer type beings called the Phoenix Born who looked like humans but they had incredible powers who finally beat back the Kimra. And now that the world is safe again, they start killing each other because why not? Uh, well, no, really, it's like this backstory that's kind of cool because you are like, it's like Highlander, where if they kill each other, they gain each other's powers until there can be only one, which really appeals to the Highlander fan in me. What the gameplay is like is a uh, head-to-head uh, strategic card play. You are trying to cast spells and summon allies and summon conjurations in order to defeat your opponent and thereby gain their power and you do this not just through hand management and card play as you might expect from this type of game but also through a clever dice system where you're using your dice as magical power and you have different symbols and you can match them up in different ways and get different special abilities i could go on and on but let's go ahead and show you how the game is played i'll give you a brief overview then we're going to come back i'll let you know what i think All right, so this is a basic setup for a two-player game of Ashes, Rise of the Phoenix Born, which in my opinion is the main way to play. It can go up to three or four players though, if you want to. Now let me just run you through some of the basic stuff that you see out here. These are just extra dice that I left off to the side because these are not currently in each of these uh, fake players' dice pools. But there's four different types, type of dice that come in this set of, the, this master set of Ashes. And each one is key to a different type of magic and can uh, fuel different types of spells and activated abilities. You have the natural dice, which have like little uh, frog pictures on them. You have the charm dice, which have hearts. You've got illusion dice, which have, I don't know, uh, wolves or something and illusionary masks. And you have the, uh, the um, what's it called, ritual dice, which have like uh, daggers and goat's heads, as you might imagine. So uh, now at the beginning of the game, each player is going to have their own deck representing their Phoenix Born, as well as their Phoenix Born character that starts in play. Now, the way that you can um, construct your deck actually is different. You have three different options right out of the, ma uh, the master set. You can do the pre-constructed decks, which is what I've done here, um, as they recommend in the back of the book. You can construct your own decks ahead of time. You and the other players can deliberate and make your own dice pool and your own uh, cards that you want to use. Or you can draft them, which is there's a whole uh, list of rules that you can do for that, which is pretty interesting and something I might delve into in the future. So you'll have your Phoenix Born card that stays in play right from the beginning. You'll have your main deck of cards. You'll have your Conjuration deck. Conjurations are creatures that you might summon during the course of the game. They will never enter your deck on their own or, or ever, but you'll summon them using other spells that are in your deck. Down here you have little player aids, the phases of play, and the dice cards, but these are kind of important because it's kind of hard to keep track of all the different special abilities in this game. And in fact, every different type of die has a different type of special ability when you use its main side. So each die has um, a, like a basic side, a mid power side, and then the, the main power side, the, the most powerful side. So for the natural die, the frog face is the most powerful. And when you use these to fuel your spells, you can actually break them down from one to another. So the most powerful face of a die can actually be used as the middle or the lower. The mid face uh, power level can be used as the, the basic and uh, you kind of get the idea there. Now also, you can use the power side, the main uh, most powerful side, as a special ability depending on the type of uh, die that it is. So for natural magic, you can use this, I'll get to all of this in more detail, but you can use a side action and the power side 
to deal a damage to a target unit. Or with the illusion magic, you can use a light action and uh, you can move one die from an opponent, uh, together with the power die, to move one die from an opponent's active pool to that opponent's exhausted dice pool. That may not make a lot of sense now, but just so you know, it just means that each of the dice has a different type of special ability if you use it just for that, independent of the cards that you have. Couple other things of note. Now, uh, as in most card games, you're gonna have a starting hand, but what's different about Ashes is that for your five card starting hand, you are deterministically picking that hand. You're going into your deck of cards that you've built ahead of time using whatever method and picking five cards that you want, which is very unique, not like a lot of other games. And then finally, there's a whole bunch of tokens in the game. You have uh, hit point markers. I'll leave you to guess which one those are. Then you have exhaustion markers, and that's this game's way of tapping to show that a card can't do anything or, or can't do most other things you put an exhaustion marker on it and in fact some spells and abilities will force cards to take an exhaustion token in order to take them out of the fight essentially then you have these status markers and status markers are a catch-all type of token for different card effects it depends on the type of card what those status tokens actually mean so let me go ahead and show you uh, some of the different cards in the game and just give you a quick breakdown of all the different uh, types of abilities and symbols and what everything means before I actually show you how a typical game turn is going to work. So here's an example of a Phoenix Born card. You have Aridel Summer Guard. Um, you'll have a little blurb over here as to uh, what her title is, Phoenix Born of the Ever Mist Valley. Then you're going to have her hit points, which is the number down here. And the way that you win or lose this game, if your Phoenix Born's hit points go to zero, you're dead. You are your Phoenix Born, essentially. Uh, then over to the side of that number, you have Battlefield and Spellboard. This is how many cards you can have in that area. Your Spellboard is where you're going to put permanent spells that you can continue to use, which means you're limited to that many of unique different types. I'll explain that more in a bit. Then you have the uh, Battlefield, which is how many allies and conjurations you have out on the field that are potentially attacking your opponent. Then each Phoenix Born has a different special ability with a different type of activation cost. Now, this game uses a lot of iconography, but what this Water Blast means here is uh, this little star star symbol is a side action. Every turn you're going to get a main action and a side action, and this requires that you use a side action. In addition, it's kind of hard to tell, but that next symbol is that same exhaustion uh, symbol. So I would have to exhaust her in order to use this. Exhaustion tokens come off during your recovery phase at the end of a turn and then or at the end of a round i should say then you have a leaf symbol which actually corresponds to your natural die which means you have to use a die that has that symbol on it or greater in order to activate an ability that lets you deal two damage to a target unit my opponent in this foe battle is uh, Jessa Nani, I'm never going to know all these names by heart, and you see that she has different stats, different amount of hit points, different amount of cards she can have on her battlefield, although the spell board is the same, and she has these screams of the departed ability, when, which is a, sort of a constant thing, whenever a unit uh, under an opponent's control leaves play, you may spend one to uh, basic mana symbol to deal one damage to their phoenix form. And let me show you some of the other cards just so you can get an idea of what you can expect uh, to see in this game. Here are some more cards from Aridel's deck. Hey, I got the name right. <laughs> you have uh, ready spells like Shifting Mist, which over here you're going to see that it has this uh, big star symbol. That means that it costs a main action and then it costs you one of your uh, uh, mid-level illusion dice powers. Now, shifting this being a ready spell means that it's going to go into your spell board, and on a later turn, you can use its ability. In fact, potentially even the same turn in this case, because shifting mist requires that you use a side action. Remember, you get a main and a side. So you could theoretically play this card as a main action and then use its ability as a side action. As well as uh, exhaust, you can change two dice in your active dice pool in your active pool to a side of your choice. Uh, another example of some of the spells in your deck: you have Out of the Mist, an action spell which requires a side action and two different types of dice. You deal X amount of damage to a target unit. You may draw a card. X equals the number of units that you have in play, which could potentially be a game changer. You have Root Armor, which is an alteration spell that you're going to use to effectively enchant one of your units on the field. Uh, this gives it life plus two down here you see and then you have respark which is uh, requires you to spend one of your basic mana essentially when a card that when this card would go into your discard pile for whatever reason you can spend the respark uh, cost in order to save it 
You have massive growth, which is uh, you take some main action in two different types of mana. This spell can only be attached to a unit with an attack value of two or less. Uh, it has spell guard. This spell cannot be affected by an opponent's spell and fleeting. You discard this card at the end of the round. And what you get for that is attack plus four and life plus four on that particular unit. This is an example of one of the many summon spells in the game. Every Phoenix Born has one or more summon spells like this. They are ready spells. So you'll put them into play and they will enable you to summon the type of conjuration listed at the top. Every card basically looks the same. Some of them are different, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, because they have different special abilities like Focus. But uh, some of her conjurations, you have Blue Jaguar. See that they all have their own different special abilities. Miss Spirit, which, uh, and they come in different quantities too. So for instance, the Blue Jaguar may have only three or five, but the Miss Spirit has, I think, 10. And then you have the Butterfly Monk. And you know, they, notice that they all have their own attack, life, and they have recovery rate as well, which means that uh, if, they're, they still sur if they survive until the end of a round, they can recover damage that they've taken. Now, Aridel's deck relies heavily on Conjurations, but most, I think all of the other Phoenixborn decks, uh, or maybe most of the other ones, have allies. Allies are not part of your Conjuration stack. You do not use spells to summon them. They're part of your deck, and you can summon them basically using, uh, just like you would cast any other spell, and they go onto your battlefield as an ally that you can use the same as your Conjuration. So, uh, just Jessa Nani, I'm sure I said that incorrectly, has the Blood Archer, and they all have different special abilities. I'm just not going to go through all of them. There's just a ton of different texts we can go through. Through, but there's the Living Doll, Leech Warriors, here's some of her spells, Cut the Strings, which can actually uh, negate an alteration spell, Blood Transfer, Undying Heart. Real quick, I'm going to show you some of the other Phoenix Born. You have Maoni Viper, who has spells like Call Upon the Realms, which lets her change her dice, and Molten Gold Attacks, Refresh, and who's that little mice guy? Oh yeah, that's one of her conjurations, the Gilders, and the Silver Snake Conjuration. Now, I wanted to show you her summon card because uh, some of the Phoenix Born, including Maoni here, have Focus spells, which means that the more of them that you have in play, the more powerful they get. For Summon Silver Snake, she can summon her Silver Snake Conjurations, but if she focuses, she places a status token on the Silver S Snake, which means if she has a, one other copy of the spell, she gets to put another status token on it, and if she puts on, she gets another one in play, Focus two so in a total of three copies in place she gets to put even more status tokens on it and the reason why that matters is because for the silver snakes uh whenever an opponent's unit is destroyed as a result of a spell attack counter ability or dice power you control place one status token on this unit if the destroyed unit was an ally removed from the game with uh, attack of x is the number of status tokens on this unit so the more status tokens he has the more powerful he is you have Noah Redmoon, who is all about uh, these ritual dice and sacrificing things. You've got Stormwind Sniper, Shadow Counter, Bound Soul, and Summoning Demon Illusions, too, is this thing. So he's got a really cool summon spell, which is actually part of his deck, Summon Sleeping Widows, which brings out these Sleeping Widows conjurations, uh, and Mass Wolves, and False Demons. You have uh, Soraya Guideman, Guideman. Uh, who has uh, really fancy cards like Enchanted by Alinus, the Rose Fire Dancer, uh, Spells, that's not so fancy, Sympathy, Pain, and Purge, and she summons Seaside Ravens and Three-Eyed Owls. Then finally, well actually not quite finally, there is a promo, um, we'll take a look at Cole Rorkin, who's uh, like the really, like the tough guy of the set. He has allies like the Anchor Knot and the Hammer Knight, that's what, probably my favorite art in the game by the way. Uh, and spells like Strengthen and 100 Blades, and his only conjuration is an Iron Rhino, because of course it is. Uh, and I think I believe that the his ready spell for that focus is to make them easier to get out. There is a promo character that you may get with your copy of the game called Demona Odin Star, who is another Phoenix born, and she comes with her own type of ally, the Rayward Knight. So that's just a taste of uh, what you can expect to see, and well, that's all, everything you expect to see as far as the Phoenix born in the Master Set of Ashes. So here's how the turns in Ashes are going to work. Every, both Simultaneously, both players are going to roll their pool of dice, and they're going to gather them. Um, at the uh, start of the game, or at the, at the start of each round, whoever rolled the most basic symbols is going to take the first player marker, and they get to go first. Uh, then every each player has the chance to discard cards from their hand and redraw that many cards. Now, the thing about this is that if your deck runs out of cards, you don't die uh, uh, right away, but every time that you would have to draw cards during the prepare phase, which is right now, then uh, you would take a damage for every card that you cannot draw from your deck. So burning through your deck too quickly, and it's not a very big deck, can be very dangerous. 
Then you go into player turns, which means the whoever's the first player and then the next player has a chance to do their actions. Every player gets a main action and a side action. I already described that a lot of the different cards require you to spend either a main action or a side action, but you have other things that you can do. For example, with your main action, you can choose to do an attack. Now let's say I'm choosing to use my main action to do an attack. I effectively have two choices for this. I can choose as many unexhausted units as I want and have them attack either a particular unit on my opponent's side of the field in their battlefield or I can choose to attack their Phoenix Born. Now if I choose to attack their Phoenix Born then any units that they have in play could come to the defense of that Phoenix Born and vice versa. If I choose to attack a particular unit, then my Phoenix Born, even if it's exhausted, can come to that unit's defense and take the hit instead. And remember that every unit's gonna have different special abilities that may have uh, come into play and affect combat as well. But how this, is work, this will work is that, uh, let's say that the both attackers are attacking this unit and the Phoenix Born is not going to defend. Both of my attackers now have the chance to deal their damage to the Leech Warrior. Without even looking at stats, let's just say that it would potentially die. Now, so long as the defending unit is unexhausted, the defender has the chance to exhaust that unit in order to do a counter. If they do they choose to do a counter, then they will simultaneously deal their damage to one of the attackers because one unit cannot block more than one creature. Now, to be specific, if this player, if this uh, unit was defending the Phoenix Born, then it would choose which one to defend against and the other one might go through. But if this unit was the target of the attack and it chooses to counter, then it, uh, well, it will defend against both of them it will have to take the damage from both, but then if it chooses to counter, if it's unexhausted, then it will choose to deal its damage in any split up way between however many targets are attacking it and potentially probably going to kill it. Regardless, any units that survive the combat are going to have exhaustion tokens on it, both the attackers and the defenders. That is assuming that there's no special abilities going on. So that's a quick run through of combat. And now the thing is you have this main action and you don't have to use it, but you, or to, to do any kind of card effect or to do combat, but you effectively have to do something, which in this case would have to be pass. If you choose not to do anything with your main action, you are just passing. Now you still have a side action that you can do, and I mentioned that a lot of different special abilities are kicked off from a side action, but you also have some other options as well. You can use the power abilities of your dice, uh, which means you get to um, activate one of them and use whatever special ability it is for that particular type of die. The other thing you can do is meditate. So I'm just putting a random ready spell into play here, but for the example, but when you meditate, you can discard any number of cards that you want from your hand, from the top of your deck. Let's just let's say that's my discard pile and from your ready spells, your spell board as well. For as many cards as you choose to discard, you get to flip that many dice that, uh, of your choice from your dice pool to the face of your choice. And finally, the last thing that you do, that both players do after each of them have taken their turns, is the recovery phase. This is where every unit that is out on the field has it, that is still alive but has taken damage has a chance to recover based on their recovery rate, and also they get to remove their exhaustion tokens. One thing to note is that cards can accrue multiple exhaustion tokens. So long as they have even one on it, they are considered you know, locked down for whatever, for whatever abilities that they have or for attacking or blocking. And finally, if you still have dice left in your active dice pool, you may choose to put as many as you want into your exhausted dice pool, meaning that you'll save the dice that you still want to be able to hold on to and use for the next round. And at the beginning of the turn, you can re-roll all of your exhausted dice and make a new dice pool. And that is a quick and dirty run through of Ash's Rise of the Phoenix Born. There's a little, a little more detail than I obviously went into, but that'll give you a general gist of what the game is about. Now, let's get to my final thoughts. You know, it's very rare that I will take the time to learn the name of an artist for the board game that I'm reviewing, just not because I'm, I'm meaning to insult them, but just because I have so many other things that I have to keep track of and things to memorize when I'm doing a review, the name of the designer, the name of the publisher, all these different things that it's just one less thing that I don't have to worry about. So I don't, even if I like the artwork, I don't make it a point, but I did make a point in this case to learn her name, Fernanda Suarez, because this artwork is Stellar. It is amazing. Now, I believe she is the same artist that Plat Hat used for Dead of Winter, and it looked amazing then as well. I believe I pointed that out. But in Dead of Winter, there's so much going on in that game. The board, the standees, the, all the tokens and the cards that you can kind of lose track of the artwork at a certain point. But in Ashes, 
that's the game. The game are these cards with this amazing artwork, so it's always there in your face. And you know, I said in my intro that I really dig the theme and the backstory of Ashes, but just by very nature of the type of game it is, it can be kind of tough to stay attached to the theme and to feel like you're these characters and to really stay in the story. But the artwork goes a long way towards helping you feel immersed in this world. And it makes me want to see more of it and see more of like the vibrant like area around where these battles are happening in these grand cities and everything that they mentioned in the little story blurb in the rule book. So kudos. I mean, I really wasn't expecting to do a review of a Plat Hat game and say, oh, it looks horrible because no Plat Hat game looks horrible. But... For it to look this good, it's just amazing. And even with just cards and some tokens, Plat Hat shows that they can make an amazing looking game. So really, really solid there, no complaints. So let's just jump right into the, the game mechanisms itself. It's inevitable that someone is going to compare this game to Magic the Gathering. It's just gonna happen. I mean, I did it too, and a lot of people, I've already heard multiple people, including myself, say, this is magic with dice instead of lands for your magic for your mana and on the surface of it yes that analogy holds true but there's just the devil is in the details there's so much more there to unpack from the very fact that yes you have this dice system and by the way the dice look really cool as well but even within them it's just not like oh here's my dice here's my mana there you're breaking down different symbols you have the four different types of dice in this set with more to come i'm sure then you have the different types of symbols from the, the power symbols down to the basic symbols and how you can break them down into each one to use them for different types of uh i'll just say mana it's easier to say it that way um and then even activate special powers for each of the different types of symbols so right there just in that dice system there's so much depth and things going on but then you're using those for all of these different types of cards in the game, which go far and above just, I'm casting a spell, I'm summoning a creature, because every bit of the game is more fleshed out than that. I mean, you start with this Phoenix Born in play, and if you, again, want to use the magic analogy, you can say that this is like a powerful planeswalker that you start off with that is you. I mean, if that character dies, you die, the game is over, for, for you at least. But it's... It's different. I mean, it, it's not only your life points, but this is a character that you can summon to the field to, uh, to defend against your allies, to use their activated abilities. I mean, they're very, very powerful, but are, they're also incredibly vulnerable. But making the best use of their abilities while keeping them safe is one of the key aspects of the game. And every single one of them feels different. Everyone has a different play style. Everyone lends themselves to different types of spells and abilities. And by the way, I'll delve into this a little bit later on, but you can custom make your deck to cater to each any of the different Phoenix Born that you're trying to use. And again, I'm sure there's many more Phoenix Born on the horizon because this game, assuming that this game is going to be a hit and warrant it. Uh, so there, there's a lot of depth as well. It's not just like, here's a Planeswalker, here's a couple of abilities they have. It's, here's a Phoenix Born. Here is all these different aspects in, of the deck that have to cater and center around this character and really flesh it out from there how the spells and the conjurations work it's not just oh i'll you know with allies it's pretty straightforward pay the magic summon them down but even then they all have a, a host of different special abilities and each one feels significant and powerful but then the way that your spells work and how you conjure these different things onto the battlefield and even just how your spells themselves, how you can focus them, that I think is a really neat idea where you have your spell board and you can have a limited amount of spells in play, but you can focus certain spells that won't count against your limit and they get better and better. So it makes it worthwhile to load up your deck with multiple copies of the same spell because you know that you're going to get better and better and give you more opportunities to use them more times per round. And that's the other thing too. The idea of using uh, the, the main action and the side action, which is, gives you, it, it's restrictive in a way, but in another way, it just opens up more sort of critical thinking to the game. It's, it's, this game is all about using the limited amount, relatively limited amount of resources that you have. I mean, you have a lot at your disposal. You have a lot of these magic dice at your disposal. And all, I mean, at a very early point in a match of Ashes, you can feel very powerful because you'll have a lot of units on the field. You'll have a lot of uh, spells in your spell board. I feel like, yeah, I've got a lot I can do. 
But you have there's a lot you can do, but you only have so many dice to use for these different things, and only those two actions. And that makes cards that let you manipulate your dice and put them on faces that you want, like like a lot of the different Phoenix Born have, different spells that they have, that makes that ability invaluable in a lot of different cases. Or being able to, you know, uh, discard cards to change faces as well. Those types of side actions are very, very powerful and very useful. Um, and, you know, you, there's a lot of ways you can mitigate that. The game is not total randomness because even from the beginning of the game, you choose the five cards that you want in hand. And then in future rounds, you can actually choose to discard cards in order to draw more, although you only have so many cards in your deck. This is the type of game where your decks are relatively small, and if you run out of cards, it's not game over, but it might as well be because then you're starting to take damage, you're hemorrhaging life just from not being able to draw cards on your turn. So you gotta uh, really close it out at that point. And man, I feel like I haven't even really scratched the surface of this game, despite the fact that it's a relatively simple game. You can really have this game up and running very quickly, especially if you're already familiar with CCGs and LCGs. There are a lot of different things in common is, but again, the devil's in the details. There's also a lot that's different, but even so, it feels pretty intuitive. If I was going to criticize the game for anything, this is just minor stuff, but just in general, despite the fact that it does have innovative mechanisms, overall, and, and this is kind of what I was just touching on a moment ago, the game still feels very much like a lot of other games that I've played, even to a certain degree, like another one of Plat Hat Games, games uh, Summoner Wars, even though that game is more like a miniatures game with cards, you're still summoning units and you know it's all about hand efficiency. I get a lot of that from Ashes as well. And again, I've mentioned Magic and a lot of other different types of games. Force of Will, this feels very similar to, which is a newer type of CCG. Uh, so it, if you're not into those types of games, I would hesitate to say that Ashes is necessarily gonna change your mind. You should still try it but it doesn't feel like overwhelmingly innovative to the point where it's an island unto itself. If you're not into those type of strategic head-to-head -head games, and this does work best as a two-player game, then you might still just wanna try it first before you go for the instant buy. Also, I would say that a lot of other types of card games of this weight feel very fast, feel very like, boom, 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 I'm putting down my mana, I'm putting down the summon, summon a creature, go! That's not really what Ashes is like. What Ashes is much more methodical almost from the get-go. Usually in a, a faster type of card game, you don't really start to get suffer from AP till the end when it's getting down to the wire and your every decision is very critical. But in Ashes, because there's so much going on, because, because you have to decide how to use your dice, how to use the powers that are associated with your dice, how to use the different activated abilities and powers of your Phoenix Born, because you have so much going on at a relatively early stage of the game, the game can drag a bit. It's mu definitely much longer than most other types of card games that I've played, again, of this weight. But really, those are relatively minor quibbles because overall, I find this to be a fantastic game. I think this is another solid head-to-head -head card game from Plaid Hat. I think it is best as two players. I think, I, I mean, and the other thing is too, I haven't really delved into the whole how you build your deck. I have lots of fun just playing with the pre-built suggested decks that they have in the rule book. Much like I did with Summoner Wars, I never delved into the deck building with that game. But it is an option for you there. They even have rules for drafting the decks as well, which is something I probably will try because I like drafting cards. Uh, but either way that you want to do it, there's so much variety in this set. There's so many different types of Phoenix born. Each of them plays differently and distinctly. Uh, different types of units, so many different types of special abilities, and that really cool dice system. This is a solid, solid game. And if you're into this type of game at all, and if you just love beautiful artwork, I encourage you to at least give this one a try. That is Ashes Rise of the Phoenix Born from Plaid Hat Games. Definitely recommend it. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.